Welcome everyone, uh, joining our first webinar hosted by the Asian Art Museum's Contemporary Art Department. I'm Abby Chen. I'm the Senior Curator and Head of Contemporary Art. May is Asian Heritage Month. This program is part of the museum's Asian American experience, which is made possible with, uh, sustained, with um, a generous support from Glenn and uh, Saki Fukushima an anonymous donor in memory of Ambassador and Mrs. Samson Shen and Cla Claudian Chang. I'm very happy to see all of you here and very often when we do these um, uh, artist talk in the museum, we won't be able to reach out to all of you um, like you're joining us now. And in the midst of COVID-19, we're all staying at home, getting connected virtually. Many of us struggle to find peace because the outside is dangerous. Dangerous in a way that in the name of COVID-19, we see real hostility fueled by racism, xenophobia, and systematic brutality. It's everywhere. We see that in this country and beyond. We see that in Europe, we see that in Asia, and of course, to our friends in Hong Kong. And everyone is experiencing this feeling of being both bodily here at home and mindfully there in the world. And today our topic is acting, learning, healing, featuring three courageous American artists, Jess Sharon Jeeva, Jennifer K. Wofford, and Chanel Miller. More critical than ever, we look to these contemporary artists, all embodying acting, learning, and healing in how they approach everyday life here and there. And due to the limited time today, they will each focus on one aspect of that. But I promise, today is only a teaser. We have more to come. And nothing beats the real thing. We want you to come back to the museum to experience what these artists will be creating for us. And also, um, connect even though this time we are connecting virtually we would love to connect with you in the museum and this is what i think our contemporary art department is all about is to build these new connections and i would like to introduce our first speaker jess sharon jiva she was born in the united states uh, she was born in the uk and raised in california and I will start share my screen. And this is Jess. She was acting on her anger because she was angry for the gang rape took place in 2012 in India. And what did she do? She took it to the street. And then this is Jennifer Wofford. And I got to know Jennifer actually through protest, through her protest. And it was um, in 2018 uh, at the Women's March. And also we share some um, common learning together because 1989 was the profound event that impacted both of our lives. The year that we experienced great trauma and great hope from the down of the Berlin Wall to the Tiananmen Massacre and also the earthquake that happening right here at San Francisco. And of course, Chanel Miller, if you don't know who Chanel Miller is, I strongly recommend uh, you Google her. And also this idea of acting, learning and healing. She took it to the court. She took it to her writing. And also the Instagram that she has right now is really a platform that where you can see um, her work, her drawings. And um, on the screen, what you see is uh, one of the screenshots from the animation, I am with her. And also, Hey has no place amidst the pandemic, uh, a special drawing that she made for the Time Magazine's Finding Hope. Jennifer, do you want to go up? Hi, everyone. Um, so 
So before I get into my uh, little short spiel here, I just wanted to sort of point out this backdrop, which is kind of related to what I'm about to talk about. And this is just sort of the, uh, the vestiges of an installation project that I did at Black and White Projects here in San Francisco in September of 2019. Okay, so look, it's me, I'm in an installation. So this is in fall of 2019 where uh, I created an installation slash video project slash performance uh, project for a small gallery uh, called Club Rupture. And it was uh, set in 1989 at the moment of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so it was kind of a TV dance party. Like I put together um, a crew of dancers, uh, almost entirely people of color, uh, as part of a narrative that I was really interested in. Um, and they basically, danced it out to a sort of a top 10 playlist of songs for 89. Uh, I was the creepy show hostess. I think this will be uh, silent, but. Watching Club Rupture. We'll be right back after these messages. So the aesthetic that I developed for this, oh, here I come again. <laughs> You're watching Club Rupture. I'll just let you enjoy that. We'll be right back after these messages. So the aesthetic that I developed for this project was uh, sort of a mid to late 80s aesthetic. Um, I was sort of interested in um, the, the legacy of Memphis design as it sort of emerged from Italy uh, in the you know, early 80s. And I kind of wanted to translate that into this very fun uh, pop cultural moment of this, uh, this installation. And I was really interested in this idea of rupture, what was happening in 1989 globally, but also locally here in the Bay Area. And so I really operated with this idea of the Loma Prieta earthquake as um, a moment of both local and global rupture. Uh, and so as Abby was alluding to earlier, this idea of all the things that were happening in 1989 worldwide, from Tiananmen Square to the fall of the Berlin Wall to a whole bunch of stuff that I'm forgetting under the, under, <laughs> under the moment right now. Um, but I was really interested in concentrating all this in this bizarre little dance party. Uh, the after effect of this, of course, was that I had really gotten, went all in on this fun aesthetic. So, oh, here I am again. Uh, and I had actually made some small paintings where I was exploring this aesthetic a little bit further and just playing with these design motifs. Uh, and so when I was uh, invited to put together a proposal to do something for the Asian Art Museum's Hyde Street Art Wall uh, in the fall, I thought to myself, well, we'll just do Club Rupture again, but make it Asian. Uh, and so I repurposed the speech bubbles that were the popping up in some of these paintings I was doing and proposed that perhaps those names would be like shout outs to some of the sort of the great figures in Asian American art history here in the Bay Area, really, you know, nationally and globally. But uh, I was very interested in this local legacy that we have that is so special and it doesn't really get the due that it deserves. So that was the original sort of this raw proposal. Um, there were aspects of this sort of aesthetic that are not, they're kind of generic, right? They're just sort of shapes and fun bubbles and forms like that. And so what I proposed is that we drill down a little bit further and create a design vocabulary or a pattern vocabulary that could be um, more unique to th this experience of Asian art or Asian American art. And so what has emerged since then is the project that will someday, <laughs> we're all crossing our fingers as to when, uh, be seen on the outside of uh, uh, Hyde Street uh, on the museum wall. And it's nine panels. Um, the total width uh, and height is about seven feet high by 38 feet wide. Um, and on each of the nine panels is uh, the name, which is a giant kind of speech bubble shout out to an early Asian American artist that was primarily based here in the Bay Area. Uh, I chose to focus on artists born before 1940 because a lot of those folks have not quite gotten their due, in my opinion. And honestly, quite frankly, by the time you push just a little bit past uh, 1940 into uh, uh, later generations, there's just so, so many names to choose from, which is uh, phenomenal but would also make it a lot harder to do the editing work for this project. Uh, I sourced 50, about 50 different patterns that are interwoven throughout uh, the surface of these panels uh, from a variety of sources. I looked at objects from the collections of the Asian Art Museum. I looked specifically at art, well, examples of artwork by these uh, Asian American artists that I shouted out. Uh, and then uh, I was also interested in looking at design and pattern traditions from Asian community traditions that were not actually in the holdings of the Asian Art Museum. Uh, most particularly, uh, you know, the two communities that are most adjacent to the museum uh, in the Tenderloin and South of Market, which are the Vietnamese and Filipino communities, um, they're 
they're a little bit underrepresented in the collection at present. I know that's changing, but so I thought this would be a nice way to kind of insert more of that. So this is uh, at least my artist rendering of what it's going to look like once it's out there. Uh, so you have a little bit of a sneak preview. Um, and here are a couple of close-up shots. So this is the left side, I think panels one through five. So in this one, you should be able to see the names Kei Sekimachi, Chiro Obata, Jade Snow Wong, Ruth Asawa, and the great Carlos Villa. Uh, and of course, moving across the right-hand side, uh, the other five panels are, again, Carlos Villa just overlapping. Uh, then Bernice Bing, Arthur Okamura, Ernie Kim, and Leo Valladour. So it was uh, almost entirely painted by hand. Uh, I was very lucky to have a wonderful studio assistant named Megan Badilla, um, who was uh, my, my evil hench person. And it was a really kind of amazing experience of working of, uh, on these panels in an extremely tiny studio um, and trying to, and, and never getting to stack any of these nine panels in a full sequence uh, in relation to one another. I had to mock up a lot of things digitally because there simply isn't enough space here to uh, fully see it. Um, Megan also helped a lot with the research process, which was about figuring out what kinds of patterns would be appropriate to use in this mural, uh, what artist names would be appropriate to use in this mural. Um, and so this is basically, there was a ton of kind of research work that preceded the actual painting. And of course, some of it was just us scrambling and doing this uh, on the fly halfway through where I would need to see um, something added to a section so we'd figure out a pattern that would fit appropriately. So for example, here's a ra uh, the range of types of things that you will uh, go on a treasure hunt for later when this mural is live. Uh, so there are moments where I've quoted this particular octagonal form uh, from uh, some Iranian tiles. Uh, there's a little bit of a quotation from this beautiful bone apron from Tibet that is in the museum collection. But then outside of the museum collection, there's uh, an interesting uh, reference that Megan included in our mural uh, to one of the great uh, Bernice Bing's paintings and this incredible ox herding uh, print series by uh, the late great Arthur Okamura. And so here's an example of how you can actually see it quoted within one of the panels. And this is a slightly cropped panel. So um, this is a very classic Asanoha hemp leaf pattern from Japan. I used that in a small sliver uh, to the upper left that you can see. I created a modified version of um, the tied with the kind of the classic tied wire sculpture uh, branch like forms of um, Ruth Asawa uh, in another segment. And it may be a little bit harder for you all to see this, but over towards the right there, those fun little pink uh, shrimpy looking things are in fact uh, um, an iterated motif of gogok beads from Korea. One minute, Jennifer. Okay, here you have another panel where you can see. Uh, the ceramic work of Jade Snow Wong uh, quoted towards the middle, um, um, a modified version of Tanalak weaving in the lower left, and this yellow floral pattern, which is a modified lamp from uh, Thailand. So this is kind of what it will be looking like by twilight as we all go wandering hand by hand in open air. Um, it'll be very romantic and I hope you all enjoy seeing it then. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, just wanted to um, make another um, shout out to uh, our education uh, colleagues because they work with uh, Jennifer very closely on um, the interpretation of her work. And I just shared in the share box with uh, the Google Arts and Culture online exhibition, which um, is a collaborative effort as I uh, previously previously said uh, in an interview that the most ideal state is that we can't tell which part is curatorial and which part is uh, education. And I think this work really embody that. And from the outside of the museum uh, that we see something from the inside and when we're seeing something inside, uh, hopefully that we can see how the artists are interpreting that uh, in the public uh, venue as well. So uh, I want to check in with uh, Jess or Chanel. Are either of you ready, Jess? OK, Jess, take it away. So um, 
very excited to have uh, the Pink Lady here, uh, coming here to San Francisco. Um, I feel like, you know, she started as little stickers um, and paste ups, and now she's um, she's basically going to be in one of the most um, reputable museums in the world now. So from the streets of Bandra, Mumbai to San Francisco um, Asian Art Museum. It's just um, a beautiful thing. Um, I created the Pink Lady um, to sell at my uh, business. We have a business called Culture Shop. It's a platform for Indian graphic artists. And uh, so I created her after the gang rape that Abby had mentioned. Um, this was for me like maybe a solution to my anger and to have something that was more going to have a more sh a longer shelf life. Um, I wanted to create her so that there'd be a conversation uh, taking place every time somebody would see her instead of us waiting to have these conversations when media would talk about, you know, the next gang rape or the next crime against a woman. Um, so, um, so this is me in Dharavi. Dharavi is a um, is one of Asia's largest slums. And I had pasted her um, at this scale for the fir very first time. It's actually the largest paste up I had ever pasted. And it was soon after I had created it for a culture shop. Um, and then I took it out to other parts of um, the city. And mainly I was starting off with um, putting her up outside of trendy areas, outside of trendy um, restaurants and such. Um, I didn't attach my name to her. Um, I wanted her to just start to pop, come up as kind of a mysterious piece, um, unless you had walked into Culture Shop um, and found her there. Otherwise, I just wanted people to kind of connect me to her afterwards. Um, I wanted it to be all about her. And this being Mumbai, it's very easy for people to get to know one another and find out about one another. So eventually, it. Um, uh, a lot of people got to know it was me, but um, it was um, that same year that um, it was BuzzFeed India that stumbled upon it when they saw it outside of a restaurant. It was the editor-in-chief um, at that time who had seen it. So she had originally posted it up asking everyone, um, who's this artist? Like, this is amazing. Um, and then within minutes, uh, people wrote to her in the comments and said, it's Jazz Turanjiva. And that's how she heard about me for the first time. She contacted me right away, and they had an article that they were going to post up about why India needs for more feminism, um, more feminists. And uh, so she urged me to go down there um, to that uh, piece that she saw, so she could take, um, so I could take a picture and hold up a sign. I didn't have time uh, to do that within the three days because we were just crazy busy. So someone suggested, why don't you just put on your T-shirt and stand outside? So I did that. And then when the article came out the next day, um, I, we just got, we got flooded with emails and um, also uh, people knowing where to order it because they connected the dots. But um, people started um, asking about this t-shirt and then they found out that there, was, there were art prints as well and they found out more about this, um, this piece. So uh, we started uh, you know, getting a lot of orders and she started to become, become really popular. Um, at that time. And um, then in 2017, um, she, a friend of mine um, who was originally a Pink Lady fan and became a friend of mine had asked uh, for me to bring it to the States. And this is after um, Trump had just joined the White House. And um, she had said that the resistance needs the Pink Lady. So what we did together, she and I, we um, created um, we got a whole line printed of the Pink Lady, um, a whole collection, tote bags, t-shirts, all kinds of stuff. And 100% of the proceeds went to, the, to Planned Parenthood. Um, I like to create things that have, you can extend um, them, you can um, expand on them. So um, just this year, earlier this year, um, they're starting in December really, uh, more so, there were um, there were a lot of protests within India. Um, this was because the Muslim population was being discriminated by a new bill, by a bill. And so um, I decided to put the Pink Lady 
um, in a burqa. And I announced on the street that the pink lady had a new sister. Um, because the pink lady was already uh, becoming popular and had become popular, there wasn't really um, a whole lot of explanation that I needed to give um, to this. But um, in India, a lot of times we say same, same, like when something's you know, very similar, we say same, same. So I, um, as a uh, placard, a, you know, a poster it could take to protests, um, I had one side of the pink lady and the other side, her sister, um, saying, same, same. Um, and then, of course, uh, then once COVID-19, um, it basically disrupted this disruption um, on the streets, so uh, people couldn't go out anymore, um, and they just uh, stuck to social media as far as, you know, being active, but no more physical protests. Uh, the other thing, um, so beyond the pink lady, what I also um, tend to do is I do use the streets as my place to amplify um, messages and get people just walking by, not just people who are following me or um, people who are, you know, within the algorithm, who, the algorithm decides who gets to see my work. Um, uh, it's very important for me to have um, my work on the streets for anybody to walk by. Um, I always wanted to push ideas of change to the public at large and using simple graphics that are easy to grasp or at least intriguing enough for people to explore further is my, um, basically my thing. And um, so here I had gotten um, cute with using English and the Hindi script. Um, this series is called You Snooze, We All Lose. And um, in this series, I, I created it in 2018. And the idea was um, this, this idea about Miss News We All Lose is the whole reason why I am an artist and why I am a street artist. I want to be able to push people's buttons and get them to change. Um, and I'm also, it's also, I'm, I'm very fortunate in Mumbai that nobody stops me from pasting anything on the streets either. So I've been lucky um, about that. And these pieces, um, they, they um, were starting to, well, starting on the left, um, they tackle different um, you know, issues. So uh, rise of the pate, pate is in Hindi, uh, pate means belly, and rise of belly, um, that is talking about, it's talking about um, the food pyramid. It's questioning the, the industries, the big industries behind food and medicine. It's also, um, tackling um, factory farming. It's asking you to start questioning everything um, about what we're spoon fed. And at the bottom, it, you may not be able to see it, it says disrupt the spoon feeding. The next uh, poster says way too many. And um, you see the number two, that's also a um, Hindi script for number two. And it says regain the balance. Um, basically, I'm just, talking about whether we should consider having, you know, families have only two children um, just to curb the population. Um, and these three pieces actually are interweaved, they, they're interconnected as well, uh, because we are worried about our population, I mean, we are worried about our planet, um, and Rise of the Paid also um, addresses that. And then I have um, something called imbalance, imbalance. So instead of imbalance, imbalance, ball means hair in Hindi. So you see a little school girl and she's being, um, her hair is being pulled. And that also is inspired, uh, for me, it was inspired by the equality scale that's, in, that's not equal. Um, so there's an, an, a balance in the scale. And it says, resist what you've learned because I really feel that as small children, um, that's where it starts. We need to be taught and we need to um, be shown certain things. So in, in the home where everything really starts, it's, you know, what are we exposed to? Um, so there, there's a responsibility for us um, to be acting and teaching our children um, correct things. Uh, this same series, again, it was in 2018 that I created it. Um, it extends to language. So each of these pieces actually has a um, whole language, um, like a whole concept behind it. 
but this one um, I'm talking more about rise of the pate. So when it talks about the future, um, it's talking, it's saying the future of our planet is dependent on our food choices. And um, I speak from a fictitious, fictitious group that, um, that I'm saying is the end is near if you're in society. And it's all about supply and demand when it comes to our food and what we demand, um, the supply will be there. So we really have to watch what we, um, really we have to watch our habits and make some changes. And I had also written the future of our nation is dependent on our behavior. And I really think that also um, talks to what's going on today about wearing masks and staying in and you know, um, dis distancing ourselves. So I'm going to be- Yes, using, half minute. Uh, thanks, just in time. Um, so I'm going to be using this series and I'm going to um, crowdsource some help so I can um, create a widespread um, series across India. And then if other people want to join in and uh, do something similar uh, with me or use these pieces, um, then we can do them in other countries as well. And that's it. Okay. So now we'll shift to Chanel. Hi, Chanel. Hey. So Chanel was um, moving to New York from San Francisco right before the lockdown. And um, before we do that, John, would you uh, give Chanel the front seat? Yes, excellent. So I know before the lockdown, Chanel was in the middle of moving to New York and she made the move right before the lockdown. And the moment she arrived, the lockdown starts and all her public events got canceled. So we're very lucky actually to have you. Otherwise, there's no way we can book you. So very happy you're here. And uh, we know that today you're gonna focus on healing. So please go ahead. Hello everyone, my name is Chanel Miller. I'm an artist and I'm also the author of Know My Name. And this is actually the first talk I get to do publicly with my identity as an artist on the front end. So that's actually really exciting. So today's a big deal for me too. Um, for those who are not familiar with my story, I was sexually assaulted on the Stanford campus in January of 2015. And that ignited a year and a half long battle in court, which ended in a guilty conviction. My assailant was sentenced to six months in county jail, although he was convicted of three felonies and he only served three months uh, in total. Um, so something that stood out to me from the very beginning of my experience was that I was always being confined to spaces that were devoid of art and devoid of self-expression. If you begin with the Rape Crisis Center, I remember there were sort of soothing images, but they were the kind that looked like they've been ripped out of a calendar. You go to the police station and then there's papers with thumbtacks on the walls. You go to the courthouse and the walls are completely blank. Um, and then you go to the waiting room in the courthouse, which is where I spent the majority of my time. Um, and that only had, you know, laminated posters and really dusty domestic violence brochures. Um, that experience let me know that lack of art is dangerous. We are always looking for cues in the external world to figure out who we are. Um, we are always getting signs from our environments to inform that knowing of the spaces we deserve to be in. And being in those spaces, you know, if you're put in places like that, there's nothing telling you that you deserve beauty, that you deserve nourishing things for your eyes to look at. There's nothing that is addressing and affirming your humanity. So as I continue to build myself as an artist, I think of those spaces that need art um, that get overlooked um, and to never underestimate the importance of what it can do. Um, I watched another talk 
with Jazz, um, where she was talking about the pink lady, which all of you just saw. And the pink lady's hand is positioned like this with the boom. And Jazz talked about how the thumb was raised, kind of like a subtle thumbs up, um, positioning it almost like a signal to say, you know, you're gonna be okay, or I got you. And that was extremely powerful to me because I know that when I was going through everything, I was always hungry for signals like that. Um, and as artists, we have so much power to send those signals out into the world for anyone who may be looking. Um, for me, I my little symbol when I was in court was monkeys. I was born in the year of the monkey, 1992. And um, 2016 was the year of the monkey, and it was also the year of my trial. And I remember thinking, things cannot go entirely wrong because it's my year, and so it has to go right. So the monkey became a little comforting symbol, almost like a guardian. Um, drawing, for me, has always been a form of self-protection. It's a way of showing other people that I possess something that's valuable that can be shared. In my book, I talk about how on physics tests in high school, I was not good at physics. And if I didn't know the answer to a question, I would draw someone shrugging and spend like all of my test time just shading in that picture, making it look really good so that even when I would get a bad grade and the teacher would see that I knew nothing, they're like, oh, she's good at drawing. You know, I always felt like I have something and it may not be exactly in line with your needs, but it's still valuable. Um, drawing to me is also completely untouchable. For the past few years, I think what I struggled most with was ownership, ownership over my body, pictures of my body, of privacy. Drawing is something that is entirely mine. It cannot be terminated. You know, if it's destroyed, I can replenish it. It just comes from this endless well of creation. And knowing that I have that has been so life-saving and so healthy for me. So when I was preparing to reveal my identity on September 4th of Last year, my greatest all-consuming fear was that I was going to be boxed in as this victim or people would say, oh, that's the girl from that case. Um, and that would be it. And that my identity as an artist would never get the chance to sort of come up for air. People wouldn't give it the room to surface. And so I set out on a creative project. I teamed up with a wonderful direct, creative director named Emily Moore and an animator named Norma. And we created this film where I recreated my story through drawing and animation and live action. Um, Abby showed a screenshot from the film earlier in this talk. But it was so wonderful because I got to draw the judge, I got to draw the defense attorney, but even getting to draw the like, curve of the judge's bald head and to ink his robe in with black watercolor and to you know make the tie on the defense attorney a little bit crooked to make him a little frumpy and to have you know scribbles coming out of his mouth it just let me know that i was fully in control i had established total agency over this world and for so long i was this person who was at the mercy of their world and the space that they dominated and the, the rules they created. And when I draw and make films, I'm creating the world and they're inhabiting my world where I get to make the rules. Um, and so that was a really wonderful feeling. It was also great to be working with other women. You know, writing is healing, but it's also extremely solitary. Um, so art has given me a chance to, you know, regain a community even now. I'm alongside two other incredible artists. Um, being able to work with a museum is amazing. It's something that I could never have imagined. And it's exactly what I had hoped for, that once I step into the world, someone will sweep me up and, you know, give me the space to, uh, 
uh, create. And that is exactly what's happening now. So I'm grateful for the community. And if you look at the mock-ups of what's gonna happen with our exhibit, the scale is phenomenal. You know, I think it says a lot that we're getting so much real estate. Again, when you talk about external visual cues, I love that, you know, young girls will walk by this and see who's dominating um, this building. I love that it's accessible from the street. And so I really look forward to the opening and telling you more about my piece. Um, okay. Anyway, right now I'm working on diary comics, you know, figuring out how to take all of this vast unknown and convert it down to these little shareable chunks um, of art that I can share and communicate with. So you can look out for those on my Instagram for now, but I'm just very grateful to be, to identify as an artist and be a part of this community. So thank you. Well, thank you, Chanel. And John, would you bring us to that uh, gallery view? So uh, I would love to invite all our speakers to uh, start the video again so that we can all see you and join us for this uh, post-talk discussion. And I was going through our attendees. Uh, very happy to know that uh, at the beginning, this was a sold out event. And I saw some familiar names, artists, um, they're joining us from all over the place. And I definitely see some familiar names from Asia. So very happy to see that as well. And I just want to uh, emphasize for uh, today's talk, what that you are hearing today from these artists only represents a very small fraction of what they're capable of. To me, they're Wonder Women and amazing skill, craft, imagination uh, that definitely can help us, or at least help me navigate this very, very difficult time. So uh, we would love to hear from you all. So please send us your questions. And I would love to uh, give it to my colleagues, Allison and Indra. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to uh, today's, uh, our technical advisor, John who is uh, making sure our technical side is taken care of. And um, please let us know, Indra and Allison, if you guys can start. I believe you guys can talk as well. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Abby, I've got questions. I'm gonna start with the first that was asked. Um, so, and this is directed to everyone. What med medium are you using to protect your artwork from being tempered? I guess um, really Joss and Jennifer because they're out, outside. I'm oh, using wow. clear coat. What, what kind of clear coat are you using, Joss? It's called um, Master, uh, oh, what is it called? Um, something Master. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. I am using this terrible, horrible, nasty stuff called Sheer Coat, um, which was recommended to me by the good people of uh, Presida Eyes Mural Center, and I trust them uh, with my life. So I, I know that they're right. It was just nasty material to work with. Uh, you have to put on four very thin sheer coats with a four inch brush. Um, and it, so what the deal is, is if somebody does tag up the surface, it can be wiped off. And then there's still three more layers of this clear, you know, the sheer coat there that remain to protect the surface of the actual paint. And it protects it from bird poop too, right? Yeah, I think it's UV protectant, poop protectant, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mine was recommended by a couple um, in the Bay Area. They both do um, uh, murals, so they recommended this one. Um, I'm just looking on my phone. It's called Master something. And I got, I got, a, um, I got an email. Um, email question because the person couldn't join us. And um, he was asking that in this post COVID, we're seeing actually more and more violence out there. And they just want to, uh, he just wants to hear your comments on that as an artist observing all of this, it, particularly as Asian American. Well, it's, it's very scary. 
um, to say the least. Um, it's really sad for anyone to just feel that they can, um, they have to think twice and um, they have to maybe also think about where they're going and or what they're saying or, um, you know, or maybe stepping out by themselves. Um, I've seen, I've heard a lot of stories um, just from reading blogs and um, seeing it on the news and um, yeah, it's just horrible. Why are we like this? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different kinds of things that we have to do strategically to undo white supremacy and xenophobia. Um, and I think as artists, we have we have one particular way in which we can do it. And actually, we have plenty of different ways to do it. But I do, I do particularly like the fact that uh, Chanel and Jess and I have all been given opportunities to basically speak to other kinds of narratives that are pushing back against that you know, maybe not as a reactive way, but in just a, a like a longer term vision way. Um, yeah, I think that the work takes takes many forms. Um, in my own project, I guess, I, I didn't make this thing thinking I was going to have to contend with this, you know, this COVID, uh, this new rise of like, you know, virulent racism thanks to COVID, but um, it sort of validates the, the narrative that I'm trying to construct anyway, which is all these voices that are often diminished or dismissed and trying to find another way to put them front and center and honor them. Yeah, when you look at the anger right now and the killing of Maude Arbery and George Floyd, there was really disturbing footage that was circulating that was really graphic and extremely traumatizing to his family and many other people. And I think our job as artists or our skill is that we can create visuals that are powerful and can manage to communicate the gravity of those situations um, so that people have a new image bank that they can use and share and communicate with so that we don't have to be using the graphic you know, evidence that's given to us. We can still protect the privacy of the victims and create new images that we can use for discussion, but I love that we have the power to conjure these images to shape the conversation. Um, and that's what I'm grappling with now. This um, question is, is related. It's directed at Jennifer. Why is it that those nine Asian American artists born before 1940 did not get their due? Do you think it had to do with World War II, the incarceration camps, et cetera? Uh, I think it's a combination of factors. I mean, many of these artists actually were extremely well known and well regarded here in the Bay Area. If you think about somebody like Ruth Asawa um, or Chiro Obata, but I do think that some of it is just the, the long standing legacy of white supremacy. But I think there's also a sort of degree of just um, regional chauvinism, I think, in the way that so much of the Bay Area art history period has gotten left out of a national uh, narrative or an international narrative for reasons that still confound me, quite frankly. Uh, you can add a little bit of sexism into that as well, probably. Uh, there's so many things to choose from. Um, but uh, what is nice is that there, there is this resurgence of interest in so many of these artists. And uh, like, for example, there was that amazing documentary that came out in Bernice Bing fairly recently. Um, so the work is getting done. Um, I think in the same way that there was a period in which like nobody knew who Frida Kahlo was. She was just like the wife of Diego Rivera or whatever. Uh, and then suddenly a lot of historians, art historians kind of brought, you know, kind of dredged some important information back out and presented it to the public. And so her legacy is now this profound thing. So I see some of that work happening within the Asian American art history narrative as well. Great, thank you. Um, and Joss, did the boom brass knuckles start as a fad and or did you have repercussions from males or the government about this? Uh, no, I haven't had any, I, I never did I have any uh, repercussions. I didn't receive any negative, um, any negativity. Um, did it start the brass uh, knuckle, uh, did it, was that, no, it, I mean, brass knuckles were, unless I misunderstood the question, but um, brass knuckles were, um, already a fad by then. Um, I've been asked a few times that I should make them into brass knuckles and I really like to do that actually, um, you know, collaborate with a um, jeweler and create that. Um, and also men, uh, so the other question uh, about men, uh, I've uh, 
basically had so many men that had written to me asking, hey, Jazz, when are you guys going to create a t-shirt for the women? I mean, for men. Um, and then finally, after I think maybe the 10th or um, 12th uh, male, then I had received one from Brooklyn, a guy saying that he was a role model for the women in his family and he deserves to have, you know, um, a shirt just like many other men um, like him. So then we decided like, okay, let's jump on this and let's start creating them because men are asking. And we've had a lot of male customers buying it for other men as well. So it's a really great sign. And as far as the government, uh, nope, nobody has um, said anything. And um, it's actually been, um, people have also wanted to license it um, for various reasons. And so I'm just sometimes a little, um, I mean, I'm very careful of like, who will license it. But other than that, it's just, it's been um, a lot of support. Um, great, so uh, another question um, about what new practices, artistic or otherwise, you three amazing women have found yourselves drawn to during this particular quarantine, shelter in place pandemic time. And that's for everyone. Yeah, sorry, say that last part of the question again, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, um, so uh, what new practices, artistic or otherwise, are you um, drawn to during this uh, shelter in place during COVID-19? Okay, so I haven't done this yet, but I'm super excited about making a whole bunch of mannequins and putting them in empty stores. Like there was this article that came out about this this creepy hotel that was apparently putting in like fake 1940s mannequins to like fill out their restaurant area so that you know diners would feel less alone and not freaked out at all and i thought this was the best thing ever um and then there was also this uh south korean uh, soccer team that got in trouble for using blow-up dolls uh, as fake uh <laughs> audience members of their games and so I'm like, I'm all in right now. I'm wanting to make a whole bunch of like creepy mannequins to play, place in businesses that are sad. I love that idea. Walking around New York, I passed an Equinox that had all these mannequins, but they were placed in clear bags, I guess, for to protect from germs. But it looks like a room full of body bags. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny, but it is. Yeah. And it's, I've seen a lot of people boarding up all the nice shop windows. I was walking, I don't know the names of the neighborhoods yet, but the shop signs, like you can hear them creaking on their chain. Like that's how quiet it is. It's like an yeah. old Western or something, but you're in the middle of Manhattan. So I, I can't really top the idea you just. <laughs> I mean, this is just a concept right now. I'm just throwing it out there. If anybody wants to come over and make mannequins at a social distancing kind of way, uh, I feel like it's just so creepy. We're just, this is, these are creepy, absurd times. Like, so there's a part of me that is all fired up about more creepy, absurd things. But like, I'm not interested in things that are mean or cynical. I'm interested in these other things that operate under these absurdist premises. I like that. <laughs> um, this is another thing. It's like, I, I feel like, particularly in time like this, seeing a lot of absurdity and, um, and a hateful uh, violence and all of that, humor is super important. And it's, it's a very powerful weapon. And I think that artists uh, are very often um, can navigate and figure out how uh, to bring that humor out, even through the most absurd and traumatic, situ traumatic situations. Mm -hmm. And um, so I love the doll thing. <laughs> Maybe we can stage it in Asian Art Museum. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, we have a restaurant too, don't forget. <laughs> yes. Well, I just think that, you know, art is a solution for many things is not always as direct in its, its causality. I, you know, there's just a, a way in which we may think we have a clear objective and it, you know, the therapy comes in other ways. Like, uh, like Chanel, I haven't read your book yet, but I was browsing around on your Instagram and I got stuck on the image of you wanting to be wrapped up like a burrito. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and to me, like, that was the therapy I needed in that moment. You know, <laughs> there, there's something so ridiculous and absurd and lovely and intimate in that moment that I was like, yeah, yeah, we can still have a fun sense of humor about things. Yeah, thank you. 
I have a couple more questions, both. Um, oh, sorry, Chanel, did you want to say something else? Oh, no, just conveying gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so along those lines, this was directed at you, Jennifer, but I think anyone can answer this. Um, when you paint large panels, like the ones you showed us, do you incorporate any dance-like movements? Your performance piece was so fun. So I guess this person can imagine you dancing while you paint. Yeah, I, you know, I, that is the first time I've used that particular graphic vocabulary and it is big and dumb and fun and it did sort of bring out more of the big, dumb, fun parts of me. Um, so yeah, I think it sort of ended up helping me figure out how to make a real dance, kind of a TV dance party out of the experience of these colors and shapes. Um, in the original Club Rupture project from, you know, or, or late last year. And, you know, once these panels are installed outside of the museum, I mean, who knows, maybe we could do something fun out there in terms of the street performance, uh, interacting with them. Uh, I haven't thought that far ahead because it just, it all feels a little hazy as to when that's gonna transpire. But I'd live in, I, you know, my goofy art studio that you're, you know, in with me right now um, is also usually where the dance parties happen. Uh, and so friends do come over here into my weird little cartoon universe and we, we do dance it out. So. Well, with COVID-19, uh, with all of this social distancing, actually s dancing on the street sounds like a great idea when we can see all your work from the outside and not get, you know, contained in the, you know, inside of a building. Um, we have about uh, five more minutes and I just want to uh, work on some technical side. Uh, we will consolidate all of these uh, notes because some great comments are from our audience today. And we'll share that with you from the survey that we will send to you. Uh, so Indra, will you be sending out the, the survey to, to our participants? Yes, I was gonna send the survey out tonight, but I'll wait till I get the notes typed up. So tomorrow or the next day, you'll everyone will get them who registered on Eventbrite. Great, and um, as you can see, today's uh, conversation are being recorded. So uh, we hope later on we can edit it a little bit and then put it online. So this is gonna be a uh, first attempt of our contemporary art department uh, hosting events, uh, hosting public forum like this. And um, we'd love to do more. Again, I want to emphasize that the artists create and uh, they need audience to support them and, um, and especially with many of these artists are not necessarily that famous, well-known, or being shown everywhere. And there's more important uh, that your support uh, will mean a lot to them. And before COVID, when we're thinking about a lot of these work, they are that fresh voice and they represent a value proposition that we would like to adopt as a institutional statement as well. And, but then it just become even more poignant uh, post COVID. And I'm just very, very fortunate that these artists uh, are willing to work with a brand new department in the museum and also to have all of you coming out to support us. So maybe let's have some parting thoughts from each of you on today's topic, acting, learning, healing, anything you wanna talk about. Oof. Um, I, that's a big question. Um, the first thing I guess that came to mind for me is just that, you know, the work doesn't stop and we are all doing this work together. Like it's, I don't think that it's, it's nice to have an opportunity to talk about this and to, to, to hang out with, the, with uh, Chanel and Abby and Jas in this space. Um, that we certainly don't own this work. Um, I just feel like it's work that we're, we, we share and we get stronger by doing it together. Yeah, this opportunity we have to be able to um, share the work and um, share perspectives. Um, I love the fact that it's going to be seen from the street, which is um, something that's always been important to me because it's just great to have people just walking by and um, actually seeing something. And the ones that may be living nearby can keep revisiting it as well. Um, I think it's just a great opportunity and it's just so nice to be able to like read your um, messages and um, on chat and 
Um, I know that we'll be getting <laughs> a lot more people um, responding to us or maybe even directly, you know, messaging us just from being, uh, getting to know us just through uh, this project here. Um, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thing to just be able to connect with people who um, tell you that, you know, something's resonated with you and you get to have a voice and share it. And it also inspires other people to do the same thing too. Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and just um, grateful for uh, what's to come. I hope everybody looks out for us because we're going to be taking over the building. That's right. For month. So it's going to be amazing and something that all of us can look forward to, even on the hard days. So let's keep going. Yeah. And again, uh, we uh, actually, you don't need us to share that with you. But once you Google, you'll find all three artists at Instagram. Follow them. They need your support. They need more fans. And they deserve way more fans than they have right now. And uh, so I would love to continue to promote you guys and, and I would love for your message to get uh, spread out more and more people will get that. Uh, I certainly benefit that um, a lot, probably the most. So really appreciative of today joining us. And also you guys, I mean, I saw a lot of familiar names. Uh, your support means tremendously to me. Personally, as I'm also starting this new job and with all of these new <laughs> artists, we're doing new things. So looking forward to seeing you soon. As I promised, this is only the very, very beginning. You're seeing a small teaser and way more to come. So goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.